number 78. Well, it's great to see everybody this morning. Appreciate so very, very much the presence of each one. It is that time of the year when I know with the break from school, we've got several that are traveling, probably this week and next. And we certainly do miss their presence. We've got a great number of visitors today. and got some that can't always be with us, but we're always thankful when they're able to be in town. And they're here today. It's just great to be together. So we can spend this time and sing praises to God and studying from His Word. Do you remember the old, you know, Charlie Brown cartoon? It's often incorporated in many of the movies. Where Lucy gets the football... And she promises Charlie Brown that she's going to hold it real steady. And all he has to do is come and do the kicking. And so he gets ready, and he goes up there. He's finally persuaded. He's trusting her to do her job. And, of course, at the last minute, she pulls that away, and he winds up on his back, having missed the kick. He trusted her, and she let him down. And for many people today, we find that there are interesting trust issues that many people have. And we want to talk about that for a little while this morning. And the character that we would like to kind of key off of is thinking about the story of Abraham a little bit. Over in Romans chapter 4 and going down to verse 12 and talking about him, Paul says, the father of the circumcision, to them which are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had, being yet uncircumcised. There's a whole lot that, that Paul is teaching in this chapter, trying to help Jews and non-Jews understand that the door and opportunity of salvation was open to all men. We'll see what a blockade he was to that understanding as we go through our lesson this morning. But one of the things that he's saying here is that we can learn a lot of lessons if we learn to walk in the steps of faithful Abraham. Abraham trusted in God. And as we mentioned, those are issues that many people have today. From a time that we're young growing up, we're often taught to be suspicious of strangers and to not uh, trust too many people. And indeed, trust can be abused. Trust can be mishandled and betrayed. There are many people who love to play the part of Lucy. They love to be able to step out at just the right moment, trying to cause calamity to some person who trusts them. But Paul says that we should walk here in the steps of faithful Abraham. And I think we're going to see as we go through our lesson this morning that indeed he is a man who trusted in God explicitly. Whenever we deal with each other, as men, men, men deal with men, we're going to have cases where individuals disappoint us, when individuals are not going to live up to their commitments and promises, when things are not going to pan out as we would like, and we often can find that our trust has been misplaced. But Abraham learned that you can safely trust in God all the time, and he's never going to let you down. One of the key relationships or key descriptions of Abraham's relationship with God was that he had a trusting belief or he had a faith in God and God recognized that trait out of faithful Abraham. In Romans chapter 4 backing up to verse 3 it says, for if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. This is the critical piece that God is watching as we begin to build. 
build our relationship with him. We have man on the one hand, and then we have our Father in heaven. And God wants us to develop a relationship with him. And that relationship begins with our having a trust in him, or we might say a belief in him. And that we can see that all of the things that he's promised has come to pass, that he has demonstrated over and over and over again to us his trustworthiness, and he should be the object and center of our faith. Oftentimes, Paul made the point. He said, I'm not here preaching with enticing words of men's wisdom. He said, I don't want your faith to rest in me because I've said something eloquent or, or I've said something that has persuaded you a certain way. He said, the whole message that I've got to present to you is of Jesus Christ and him crucified. I want you to understand that your trait, your faith, and your trust is in him. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, Paul says, I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. He said, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but was in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Oftentimes, individuals develop quite a, an affinity or likeness for a certain, maybe evangelist of note, somebody who they see as eloquent, entertaining in his presentation, and so as a result of that, they have great allegiance to him. And wherever he goes, they will go. Whatever he says has got to be law because they really trust in him. And Paul's saying, I want your trust to be in God. He said, your faith should not stand in how smart the speaker is and how eloquent the speaker is. I want it to stand in recognition of the power of now, when we start talking about the trust of faithful Abraham, we can begin to marvel at some of the ways in which that is demonstrated as we look at the story of Abraham. You know, as we see from the beginning, Abraham has developed a trust in God, an appreciation of his promises. And when he removed the family from Ur of the Chaldees over to, to Haran, you know, that was a big departure from all their familiar background and all the idolatrous practices and all the things that were going on there. But God wasn't done with Abraham yet. And he told him, I want you to pack up and I want you to go to a land that I will show you. Well, where? To a land that I will show you. So Abraham wound up packing up his stuff and going at the command of God, not knowing where he went. Over in Hebrews chapter 11, and going down to verse 8, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place where he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whether he went. Here was a man that made that move. I'm going to leave and go wherever it is God's going to send me. I'm going to move to a new land. For all that he knew, God could take him out in the middle of the desert and let him die there. But Abraham trusted that God knew what he was doing. God was in control. And that only good was going to come in his obeying what God said. Once again, he had a trust in God. A trust that this is going to be okay. A trust that whenever God had said it, that
that is exactly what I am to embrace. That is exactly what I am to do, even though I may not understand. I may not know why. I may not understand the, the, the sense of this. I think about the case with Philip. You know, Philip left Jerusalem due to persecutions over in the book of Acts. And so he left there from, from Jerusalem and he goes on down to Samaria and he begins to preach and to teach. And he builds up quite a congregation there. And things are going well. And the apostles come down and impart gifts of the Spirit. This work is really up and roaring. And then God says, I want you to take off and go to this deserted road out here and meet with this Ethiopian that I want you to talk to. Now, why? I mean, things are working here. The church is growing here. Good. Because there's somebody out there I need you to talk to. And Philip arose and went. Oftentimes, God moves us from here to there in various ways and for various reasons. Got to have the trust that he knows what he's doing. Another illustration of a testing of the trust that Abraham had in God was when God began to make promises to him, as over in Genesis chapter 12, that I'm going to make of thee a great nation, I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Okay. I don't have any kids. How is that going to happen? And God tells him when he reaches advanced age, you are going to have a son. Oh, really? In Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1, it says, When Abram was 90 years old and none, the Lord appeared unto Abram and unto him, saying, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me, and thou shalt be perfect. Verse 17, he then tells him, remember, backing up to verse 16, I will bless her, talking about his wife, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. And then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? This seemed incredible. In our old age, we are going to have a child. God repeated himself in verse 19. God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed. And thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant. And with his seed after him. You're serious. You're saying we're going to have a child when I'm 100 and my wife is 90? God said, yes, yeah. that's exactly what is going to happen. Over in chapter 18, going down to about verse 9, there were some visitors that show up at Abraham's house later on. And they said to him, where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. And that's exactly what happened. Isaac was born a little bit less than a year later. When you begin to look at this scenario as well, Abraham said, okay, Lord, I hear you. I know what you're saying. It doesn't seem possible to me. I didn't understand why you wanted me to move, but you did. And then God explains, one day going to be your inheritance. And I don't see how we're going to have children in our old age. But you said, if we're going to, I trust you in that, God. And sure enough, even though it seemed impossible, it came to pass. But then 
came the real test of things in terms of Abraham's trust of God. Because over in Genesis chapter 22, after the boy is here, they've been enjoying him for several years. He is certainly the pride of their life. They realize the promises of the covenant are going to be through him. Through him, all nations of the earth will be blessed. This is just absolutely wonderful. You can imagine the excitement in that household. And then God says, now I want you to offer that boy as a sacrifice. Genesis chapter 22, verses 2 and 3. God said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and give thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, rose up and went unto the place which God had told him. This boy that you've made all these promises through, and now I'm supposed to kill him and offer him as a sacrifice? Now, what kind of sense does that make? It doesn't have to make sense, Abraham. Just do what I tell you to do. Once again, if there was ever a man who had a right to have some trust issues, Abraham would be a candidate for that spot. Because these things weren't making sense. These things didn't seem to, to, to be panning out in any kind of predictable form. But he didn't doubt about that. It said he rose up the next morning. Got everything ready. And they headed out for Mount Moriah. Over in Hebrews chapter 11, it gives us a little bit more insight as to his thinking. As to some things he'd learned along the way. You know, he even had this boy miraculously. It wasn't normal for a hundred year old man and a ninety year old woman to have the birth of offspring. If God had done that, some way or another, he is going to make this work. Do we see how the trust and the belief of Abraham is growing toward this God that he serves? Over in Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in seven, verse 17. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he had received him. In a figure. I'm going to do what God's told me to do. Even though I don't understand the whys and wherefores. With God, all things are possible. I've learned that in the belief of my in the belief in our having this child in the first place. And so while it makes no sense to me as to why I've got to kill him and offer him as a sacrifice, I'll do it because God is faithful to his word. And if he wants to, he can resurrect the dead body of my son and give him back. <laughs> to fulfill the promises that have been given. So in these three ways, we see here some very difficult situations that the only way Abraham was going to get through them was to have a trust in God that wasn't going to wait. This is going to work out. I don't know how. I don't know when. I don't know why things are like they are. But God's good. And he's going to take me through all of this. Now, you know, there is a, an obstacle that sometimes we get hung up on in the day and time in which we live. I understand that in the days of Abraham, God spoke to Abraham directly and told him what he wanted him to do. Because he was living during the age of the, the patriarchs, as we call it. We don't have that kind of communication from God. Giving us these types of directives as to what we should do tomorrow and what should be the next step. We haven't got that. But what we do have is the law that God has given to us in the page of the scripture. The word going to guide our every step. Now, sometimes we kind of get 
get twisted on that. You know, whenever Abraham was making all of these decisions that he made, he wasn't able to go to a scroll someplace and look it up and say, oh, that's why I'm doing this. He did it because God said do it. Over in Galatians chapter 3, and going down to verse 19, it says, Wherefore then serveth the law, Paul answers. It was added because of transgressions of the seed should come, to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of the mediator. One day later on, the law of Moses would be given, and then eventually that law would be taken out of the way, and the law of Christ would replace it. And sometimes we get so intent on that law and every one of the details in that law that we can we quit trusting in God. It's just check boxes. Have I done this? Have I done this? Have I done this? Have I done this? And we forget about this trust component. Over in Galatians chapter 3 and going to verse 24 talking about this law here Paul explains why it was added. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. The law is a wonderful thing. And yes, we must have Bible authority for everything that we do. But there's a backstory here. And that backstory is that all that we do arises our belief and trust in God. We're not just meeting up with human tradition. We're not just stepping into the, to the ways that someone tells us we're supposed to go. We're developing the kind of trust in God that Abraham had and said, I will go forth doing whatever he has instructed. And since he does not give that instruction to me in loud verbal form today, I'm going to read the word that he's left for me, which gives me the instruction that I need and the direction I need to go. Over in Romans chapter 4, going down to verse 16, look what it was that made Abraham such an outstanding man. Here in Romans chapter 4 and going down to verse 6, he says that even that David also described the blessedness of the man under whom God he imputed righteousness without works. Here he's talking about this man. I'm up in verse 3. What saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Abraham started out believing whatever God told him to do was going to be okay. <laughs> whatever that was. Sometimes we can spend all of our efforts looking at Oh, what does this mean? What does that mean? How, how do I interpret this? Am I keeping this part of the law? Am I keeping... We become fascinated with the law. That's what the Pharisees in the New Testament had done. They became fascinated with the law of Moses and where they could check all the boxes of all the things that they'd done. And they forgot about the lawgiver. The one who trusted that they were to trust. The one who was looking out for their souls, the one who was giving them everything, as we would see in the New Testament, that pertains to life and godliness. Verse 11, Romans uh, uh, chapter 4, he talking about the, the, the work of Abraham. He said that he might be the father of all them that believe, so that he not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Abraham blazed a trail for all men. We've got to start out with a belief and a trust in God. As Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4 tells us, He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Abraham was faithful because he realized that God is. And that God is a rewarder of men, that di of those who diligently serve, uh, seek him. And Abraham says, I'm going to be one of those seekers. That's what the scriptures are telling us. It's not just open and finished, need to be baptized. Yes, that's a command of scripture. That's 
what the law said. But why? It's because if we believe God is, that we have a belief of who he is and what he can do, and that he's made the promise that if we'll trust him, and if we will then obey what he's commanded us to do, then heaven can be ours. It's not just cold ordinances written in a book. It's my understanding what I need to do and having the willingness to do it. If children want to show respect, love, and trust in their parents, life is a whole lot easier when they comply with what they're told to do. They demonstrate their love. They demonstrate their trust by being obedient. Whenever we think about faithful Abraham, we understand a lesson for all of us. If one has a trusting faith in God, he will do whatever God has commanded. Abraham was told to move. He did it. He was told he was going to have a son. Much to his surprise, he did. He was told to offer that son as a sacrifice. He did it. He did what was commanded of him of the great God that you love and the great God that you trust. Over in James chapter 2, James talks about the fact that we are going to do the things that the Lord tells us to do. Whenever we love him enough to understand, it's not just a talk about it sort of thing. It's, oh, I love Jesus. Oh, I just want to serve God. And we can talk it to death and still not do anything. The point is, if we trust and truly believe that God is, we will comply and do whatever he's given us the command to do. In James chapter 2, going down to verse 21, James says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God. And it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. So what we find here is that our obedience is not because somebody's pressured us into it. Our obedience to the command of scripture is not because we were boxed into a corner and the only way we were going to get any relief was to finally give in and do what they've told us to do. Our salvation based upon our trust and belief in God. And whatever he's told us to do is not going to be a problem. Because even though it may not seem to make sense to us, for to many people, the idea of being immersed in water is stupidity. Do you believe in water salvation? <coughs> no, I believe in doing what God said to do. said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's about as plain as it gets. So we wind up understanding things that it's important for us to trust and believe in God, but the law is also critically important. See, some people want to drop off that side of the equation. And it all becomes a matter of, well, I feel good in here. And I just believe that God and I have it all together. And I just think, well, look here at James chapter 2, a little bit further, verse 24. James said, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Some folks want to make it either or. Either I'm saved by faith and grace or I'm saved by works. James said it's neither one of those, it's both of them together. Go up to verses 18 and 19. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Over and over again, the question was asked in Scripture, What must I do to be saved? And they were never told, well, nothing. Just trust in God, and it'll all be fine. They were told to do. There's no way that we can do 
divorce faith and works from each other. Because if we trust and believe in God, we're going to do whatever it is he's told us to do. If he said salvation meant you had to go outside the building and run around seven times, I'd be out the door. He told Naaman to go dip in the River Jordan seven times. Didn't make any sense to him. But once he did the seven times, he came up clean. It doesn't have to make sense to me. It's a matter of my having enough trust to know that God's not going to steer me wrong. And I'm going to do what's right. But by the same token, as we think about the importance of doing what is right, sometimes we can sound like the New Testament Pharisees and that it's all about works. Have you done this? Have you done that? Have you done the other? Have you done this? Have you done that? And what about this? And what about that? And so it's as though somehow or other we're going to get to go to heaven because we've kept the law perfectly. That's not going to happen. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Jesus says we've got to be pretty careful about judging other people. Matthew chapter 7, the first five verses. Because we can get all hung up on trying to find the mode in their eye. And we can't see the beam that's in our own. It's important for us to understand that we have been offered the free gift of salvation. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, that offer is laid out there. God was rich in mercy. For his great love for when he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. But it's not just because he's a great God. He says, going a little bit farther down in verse 8, for by grace you are saved through faith. You trust him, you'll do what he's told you to do. And he has told you to do some things. And that in no way lets you earn a heaven. My being baptized in water in no way equals seeing the Son of God suspended between heaven and earth dying on the cross. It's simply the condition God has laid before man. Saying if you want the benefits of my son's shed blood, then here is what I want you to do morning, the question is, do we have a trusting faith that truly will allow us to walk in the steps of faithful Abraham? Abraham gave us a message and a lesson loud and clear. I love God. I trust God. I believe that what he tells me is right. And even though it sounds pretty fantastic to me, God's greater than I am. He's smarter than I am. He knows the big picture that I don't know. But he's given me the one little piece of what I can do. I can be baptized for the remission of my sins to show my belief in him. I can resolve to turn away from sinfulness as I repent. I'm willing to confess my faith in Christ, the Son of God, as other New Testament examples show me. Our trust and belief in God. You know, whenever God told Abraham to take Isaac up to the mountain, he had to get the wood ready. They had some traveling to do. Then once they got to the mountain, there was the altar to build. Abraham didn't flinch anything. Because it all was part of the fulfillment process of what God had told him to do. And he trusted God enough to know while you know, I can almost see Abraham crying as he puts all the wood in place, knowing what the next step is. Because he trusted in God. And as we mentioned, we trust in God. We'll listen to the commands of Scripture, or his commandments.
illustration is always with Lucy, to pull up the football away so that we're going to land flat on our back. We've probably all been down that road, yet we've all gone through that before Jesus. But this is something we trust in without reservation. God's not going to lose football. He says, you'll be faithful unto death. You want that this life is over. If you want that hope of heaven, if you have not yet made things right between you and your God, if there's some way we can help you.